Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak, reacting to North Korea's list of preconditions for dialogue. South Korea says it has no intention of cancelling planned military drills with the US or lifting sanctions on the North just for the sake of talks. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says he may leave out key descriptions of Japan's World War II conduct in a statement to be issued in August on the 70th anniversary of its defeat. First, the leader of Greece's left-wing Syriza party, Alexis Tsipras, is sworn in as Prime Minister amid fears about what his win means for the country's bailout agreements with the European Union. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Tuesday, January 27th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. And we begin with the slowing momentum for inter-Korean talks. South Korea's proposal for dialogue with North Korea has gone unanswered for one month now. Pyongyang has since laid out a list of preconditions that it says must be met before starting talks, but Seoul says it's not willing to consider them. Hwang sang starts us off. South Korea says it has no plans to consider North Korea's demands for returning to dialogue. Unification Ministry spokesperson Im byung tae said Monday the preconditions laid out by Pyongyang are issues that could be discussed at the negotiating table. For fundamental improvements in inter-Korean relations, South Korean government believes it's not appropriate to accept North Korea's unjustified preconditions before any talks are held. One of the key preconditions laid out by the North is cancelling the upcoming joint military drills between South Korea and the United States. The state-run Dodong Shimun newspaper on Monday reiterated that inter-Korean relations will meet a dead end if the exercises take place as planned. The paper claimed that the trust between the two Koreas will only be restored after the joint drills are called off. Seoul and Washington say the annual exercises are defensive in nature, but Pyongyang calls it a rehearsal for invasion. Amid the inter-Korean tug-of-war, chief nuclear envoys from South Korea, the U.S. and Japan will meet in Tokyo on Wednesday to discuss issues related to North Korea. South Korea will hold a separate vice minister's meeting with the U.S. in Seoul on Thursday. Amid fears of a possible loss of momentum between the two Koreas, the unification ministry says its month-old offer for dialogue still stands and that it's waiting for North Korea's response. Hwang sang Arirang News. Now it's emerged that North Korea has introduced a regulation that would allow it to detain South Korean businessmen at the joint Kaesong Industrial Complex if it found the businessmen were not carrying out their contractual duties. Seoul's unification ministry said on Monday that it told North Korea in November in verbal and written messages that it would not accept these new bylaws. North Korea notified Seoul of the changes back in September. The ministry says the North has no legal basis to detain South Korean businessmen at the complex, adding that the highest level of punishment really would be just having them sent back to South Korea. Pyongyang has yet to respond to Seoul's latest comments on this rather sensitive matter. Now, with this year's policy goals set, President Park Geun-hye is expected to announce a partial reshuffle of her cabinet this week. For more on which key players will likely move and who will stay put, our presidential office correspondent Chae reports. By carrying out a cabinet reshuffle since nominating a new prime minister last Friday, President Park Geun-hye likely hopes to regain public support for economic policies as she enters her third year in office. The president's approval ratings dropped to an all-time low of 30 percent, following allegations of her aides abusing their power and disorder surrounding a document leak from the presidential office. The pending reshuffle, expected to come early this week, will most definitely include a new oceans minister. A ruling party lawmaker close to the president, Yuki Jun, who once practiced maritime law, is widely talked about candidate 
The shakeup could also include the unification and transport ministers, both of whom enter the cabinet after President Park's inauguration. The president has repeatedly spoken about improving inter-Korean ties this year, the 70th anniversary of the division of the two Koreas, and looks set to add momentum to our unification preparation drive. The transport minister could be dismissed after the government was criticized for its investigation into the recent nut rage incident on a Korean Air flight. But the cabinet's economic team, led by Finance Minister Choi Kyung-hwan, will likely stay put to enforce the president's economic revitalization plan and public pension and labor reforms. As for the presidential chief of staff Kim Ki-chun, some speculate he could resign sooner than later, as both the cabinet and presidential office shakeups are expected to be completed by next month. Choi Yoo-sun, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye is urging Korea's financial sector to think outside the box when it comes to investing in ideas. In a video message for an event hosted by the Korea Financial Investment Association on Monday, the president emphasized the financial sector's role in helping to uh, realize the government's creative economy and achieving economic reforms. She said Korea is facing a very important period where it must prepare for another 30-year cycle of prosperity and called on the sector to support new ideas and innovative challenges. She also vowed government support to uh, remove outdated practices and regulations for the financial and IT sectors to help make them more competitive internationally. Korea's finance minister has pledged to help the nation's young people find work. Meeting with a group of college students in Seoul on Monday, Choi kyung hwan said the government's top economic priority as it undergoes structural reforms should be to boost the country's youth employment rate. In Korea, the jobless rate for those aged from 15 to 29 stood at 9% last year, which is uh, very high and much higher than the overall rate. The minister also vowed to improve government policies aimed at supporting working mothers so they can more easily balance work and family life. Che said structural reforms may be a painstaking process, but they are necessary to make Korea a better place to live. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has hinted his statement to mark the 70th anniversary of Japan's defeat in World War II may not include key phrases of remorse over his country's wartime atrocities. Park ji -won has more. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has suggested he may not include key expressions used by previous administrations to show remorse over Japan's wartime wrongdoings. Abe is set to release a statement in August marking the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. In a televised interview, he said, it's not about whether we use expressions that have been repeated in the past. Although he plans on inheriting the spirit of previously issued statements, he added that he wants to put out a statement that represents his administration's stance on the 70th anniversary. The Korean government expressed concerns on Monday. Seoul's foreign ministry said if Abe is sincere about upholding the spirit of previous apologies, his new statement should include expressions that could heal and improve relations with neighboring countries. Abe's stance has also garnered criticism in Tokyo. The leader of Japan's main opposition Democratic Party, Katsuya Okada, among others, called these remarks intolerable, saying it will deny the peaceful path that Japan has taken over the past seven decades. In a statement in 1995, then Prime Minister Tomichi Murayama expressed deep apology over his country's colonial aggression, which caused tremendous suffering to mark the 50th anniversary of Japan's defeat. And in 2005, then Prime Minister Chunichiro Goizmi used similar key expressions in his statement on the 60th anniversary of the end of World War II. Park ji -won, Arirang News. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak.
Alexis Tsipras has been sworn in as Prime Minister of Greece in a ceremony at Athens' presidential palace. The Syriza leader has formed an anti-austerity coalition government with a right-wing party to form a functional majority. Gonsoa reports. It took less than an hour of talks for Greece's newly elected far-left anti-austerity Syriza party to form a coalition with the independent Greeks, a far-right party also against austerity. This unusual alliance comes after the Syriza party's victory over the conservative New Democracy Party in Sunday's snap elections. And this coalition gives the party, two seats short of a majority at the parliament, a chance to form a government. Greek people will re regain social cohesion and dignity. And the message is that our common future in Europe is not the future of austerity. It's the future of democracy, solidarity and cooperation. Syriza's main pledge was to undo many of the reforms the outgoing government carried out to keep the Greek economy afloat. And its win and coalition with another anti-bailout party sets up a showdown with international creditors that have been pressuring the country to tighten its belt. The European Central Bank, one of the creditors, was quick to reaffirm its stance of no debt relief for Greece. They have to pay. Those are the European rules of the game. There's no room for unilateral action in Europe that doesn't exclude a discussion, for example, on the rescheduling of this debt. Greece's debt topped 369 billion U.S. dollars last year, while its unemployment rate stands at 26 percent and a third of the population live under the poverty line. Konsoa, Arirang News. Japan's government has promised to keep using diplomatic channels to secure the release of Japanese hostage Kenji Goto, but has admitted that it is yet to make direct contact with his Islamic State kidnappers. Tokyo says it's coordinating efforts with other countries, especially Jordan, after the group amended its ransom demand to a prisoner swap. In its latest video, which you're seeing some excerpts from there, a man's voice, purportedly Goto's, reads a statement saying that he would be freed in exchange for the release of a woman who is facing the death penalty in Jordan for taking part in a series of hotel bombings 10 years ago. Japan's deputy foreign minister, who has been sent to Jordan to work on the crisis, has promised not to give up until they save Mr. Goto. Now, despite slowing growth in China, more Korean companies are eyeing the country for its vast uh, investment options. Korean corporations believe a free trade agreement between Korea and China, which could be coming soon, will open up a plethora of business opportunities this year. Shin Semin reports. Korean companies' investment in China hit an eight-year high last year, even as Korea's exports to the world's second largest market fell. The Korea International Trade Association said Korean companies spent nearly 4 billion U.S. dollars in China to set up plants, open shops or expand businesses in 2014, up 30 percent from the previous year. That brought $60 billion to cumulative investment in China by Korean companies. The rise compares with a 39 percent fall in investment there by Japanese companies last year. Officials at the Trade Association say Korea's shipments to China, which account for about a quarter of the country's overall exports, fell for the first time in five years last year. But most Korean businessmen believe they will benefit hugely from a bilateral free trade agreement due to be signed this year. The nation's top tech firm, Samsung Electronics, was the largest Korean investor, pouring some $2.3 billion to build a semiconductor plant in Xi'an. Korean entrepreneurs also saw new service sector opportunities in the market with the world's largest number of consumers. Korea-owned chains of coffee stores like Cafe Bene, Tusan Place and Man together opened more than 1,000 shops in 2014 alone. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Korean battery and chemical materials maker Samsung SDI plans to pump more money into its business this year. In its fourth quarter performance announcement on Monday, Samsung SDI said that it invested some 440 million US dollars last year and it's going to significantly bolster investment this year, particularly 
on polymer batteries. Now, polymer batteries are mainly used in vehicles, laptops and smartphones. The leading battery maker raked in some 1.75 billion US dollars during the fourth quarter alone, with operating profit around 37 million dollars, but it actually had a net loss of around 120 million dollars. And that's while on uh, quarter revenue and operating profit slightly increased, the net loss was mainly due to last year's merger with an affiliate. Now, when it comes to making the choice between cash or plastic when shopping, Koreans choose to swipe their credit cards for more than half of their purchases. The Bank of Korea says plastic card usage, credit and debit card, accounted for 51% of all sales transactions last year. The figure puts Korea at the top of a list of seven, seven major economies. You can see there Canada came in second at 41%, followed by the US and Australia. The bank survey of 2,500 people also revealed that Korea was top in terms of credit card possession, with the average person owning an average of 1.9 cards. Time now for a look through some of the global headlines we're following this Tuesday morning. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. New this morning, a NATO training exercise went horribly wrong when a Greek fighter jet crashed at a military base in Spain, killing 10 people, including the two pilots. Spain's defense ministry said the F-16 was taking off from Los Llanos Air Base in central Spain when it lost power and crashed into a parking area for other planes. Officials also said 13 others were injured, six of them seriously. Video showed dark plumes of black smoke billowing as flames engulfed the fighter jet. The nationalities of the casualties have yet to be disclosed, though reports suggested they came from various member nations of the alliance. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg called it a tragedy that affected the entire NATO family as he extended his condolences to the grieving. Kurdish fighters have pushed out Islamic State militants from the key Syrian border town of Kobani after a grueling four-month battle against the extremists. Tens of thousands of Kurds had been forced to flee last year when IS forces launched an assault using heavy weaponry taken from Iraq. It is a strategic blow to the Islamic State, which tried to capture Kobani for control over the border crossing with Turkey. The group's black banner was replaced by a Kurdish Kurdish flag on Monday as fighters celebrated the hard-fought victory. The UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights confirmed the news, adding that the Kurdish militia, known as the YPG, were carefully combing the region for mines and booby traps. And turning our sights now to the United States, several states in the country's northeast are bracing for a monster blizzard, a storm that the country's main weather agency has warned will be crippling and potentially historic. A state of emergency has been declared in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts as authorities urged residents to head home early and avoid all non-essential travel. New York's Mayor Bill de Blasio said all vehicles that are not not emergency vehicles will be banned on the roads of New York City after 11 p.m. on Monday as thousands of planes were grounded in and out of the region's airports. Hurricane speed winds and up to 90 centimeters of snow are forecast with the storm to affect Philadelphia all the way up to the Canadian border. A blizzard warning affects a region inhabited by 20 million people. And finally, Ukraine's government has issued a state of emergency in the country's eastern areas, partially controlled by pro-Russian rebels. Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk said Monday the measures will affect Donetsk and Luhansk and orders the regions to be on high alert amid escalating conflict. This as NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg dismissed an earlier claim by Russian President Vladimir Putin that NATO forces were fighting alongside. Kiev's troops. He called the allegations nonsense, saying that foreign forces in Ukraine are Russian.
a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off with our 2015 Asian Cup coverage. Now, of course, last night's big match was Korea versus Iraq in the semifinals with both teams one win away from the final. Now, they faced each other twice in the knockout stages before and twice. Iraq has won by a penalty shootout most recently back in 2007. Will it happen again? Well, no way, says Cinderella man Lee jung Hyup, who won a brilliant set-piece play started by Kim jin Su. Heads one past the goalkeeper, scoring yet again in this tournament, giving Korea the 1 0 lead in the 19th minute of the match. But an insurance goal in the 49th minute of the match when Kim Young Gwan sneaks this one past the reach of the goalkeeper, giving Korea the 2 0 lead in the 49th minute as Korea's Kim Jin Hyun gets another clean sheet for a 2 0 win. With the win, Korea advances to the final as they're set to face off against the winner of Australia and the UAE. Now, when Olympic swimmer Soon Yang tested positive for doping, it really shocked the swimming world even here in Korea. But last night, reports have come out that the Marine boy Pak Tae-hwan tested positive as well. Now, the initial report was Pak Tae-hwan testing positive on a banned substance, but his management team, Team GMP, came out in a press release stating the reason for the positive test. Now, according to the team, he received shots for his knees through a hospital, which was treating him for free. And while the doctors stated that it was safe, it wasn't the case, as they cited the incident as the reason for the positive test. Now, they added that Pak is very careful and that he doesn't even take cold medicines just to be safe. Super Bowl 34, St. Louis Rams versus the Tennessee Titans. The final play was Titans wide receiver Kevin Dyson getting tackled at the one-yard line. The Rams winning the Super Bowl with a final score of 23-16. to uh, really one of the closest moments in sports. Well, PGA's Park Sung Jun also came that close of winning his first PGA title, only he was quite happy with this result. With the 2015 PGA Humana Challenge taking place over the weekend, 29-year-old Park Sung Jun shoots a 7 under par in the final round, finishing off with a 21 under par overall, just short of the winner Bill Haas, who would win the tournament at 22 under par. But despite the runner-up finish, it was his best finish ever, with his previous best being tied for 32nd just last year. Now, Victor An, a.k.a. An Hyun Su, might represent Russia now, but Koreans still cheer for him whenever he competes. Unfortunately, he came just short of winning his second straight European Championship gold. That's by winning the 500-meter event, the Russian uh, gold medalist finishes fourth in the 1,000-meter and the 1,500-meter event and finishes with 71 points in total, falling short behind Netherlands' Sinke Kunyet for a silver medal finish. Now, not a bad finish despite falling short and winning his second straight European gold. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning to you. I'm Lee ji here with your latest weather updates. Uh, from spring-like weather conditions to winter-like temperatures again, uh, readings have plummeted once again this morning, and it feels like minus 6 here in Seoul and colder in some parts. So dress extra warmly before heading out this morning. And also afternoon highs will be 5 to 6 degrees colder than yesterday, hardly rising to freezing mark here in the capital. And people in Gangwondo and Gyeongsangdo provinces will receive heavy snowfall of up to 30 centimeters into tomorrow. So be extra careful if you're in those regions. In the meantime, the rest of the country should have mostly sunny skies throughout the day. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. Now the daily low here in Seoul is kicking off at minus three. Then the daytime high will only rise to zero, and that's about six degrees lower than yesterday. While Daegu and Gwangju should peak at six and four, and Busan will top out at ten this afternoon under partly sunny skies. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It seems like Jeju Island will rise to 7 later on. Daejeon will top out at 4. And it will be a snowy day for Dokdo and Mount Kungang, topping out at 3 and minus 12 later this afternoon. Well, that's all for the weather. Hope you have a wonderful start to the day. And let's send it back to Mark in the studio. 
Well, thank you very much, Gion, for the weather as always. And that really is going to do it for now. Korea Today is coming up at 7 a.m. Korea time. That's in about half an hour. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.